Welcome. My, I'm Damon Brown. I'm the host of bringingworth.tv. You can watch me every Wednesday and Sunday at 11 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, Vegas time. It's an interesting month. We do a lot of special things this month because I'm coming to you live every single workday. We're almost at the end of September, the recording of this. So it's been about 21 episodes, something like that. Your math is probably better than mine, <laughs> but it's been a wonderful month connecting with y'all. Usually you can catch me Wednesdays from uh, Wednesdays and Sundays at 1 p.m. Pacific, Pacific Standard Time, Vegas time, if I can get out of my mouth. <laughs> if you want support with me being a business coach, I can help you as a side hustler, as a solopreneur, otherwise a non-traditional entrepreneur, and you want this free game, be sure and check it out. Subscribe for free at the links below. If you're on Amazon, you can follow me on there. Whatever platform you're at, connect with me, and I'll be coming through to support you on your way. And my new book is coming out almost exactly a month from now, less than a month from now. The Complete Bringing Worth Collection. It's all the books, almost all the books from the past six, seven years of me supporting you, again, as a side hustler, a solopreneur, or otherwise a non-traditional entrepreneur. It's the first time they're all together. I consider it a capstone. I'm very proud of the work. And there's some bestsellers in here, so do not miss out on this opportunity. It'll be out October 20th. If you'll buy it directly from me and you want a signed copy, you can just come to DamonBrown.net. All the links are below. If you want to support an indie publisher and work with indie uh, bookstores in your area, just go to bookshop.org. Again, the link is below. All my books, including the new one, are all available on there. Check that out. And of course, y'all over on Amazon can just click the highlighted link. It's been a great month so far as far as connecting with y'all regularly on the live. I actually had a marathon about two weeks ago talking about all the stuff that you need to get ready for 2024. We're almost at the end of the year. Excuse me, the last quarter, the last season begins in like a few days, which is unbelievable. As of this recording, it's going to be October 1st in like a week. It's it's amazing. Time is just flying. I want to make sure that you're all prepared to make the best of 2024. So I ended up doing a live marathon that uh, ended up ran, running two weeks ago. It's still available. Literally thousands of y'all came through during the live live play of it. The replay is still moving to be sure and check it out. It talks about emotional intelligence, which you need to up level your business or even your personal life. It talks about passive income, which will allow you to focus on the things that you really want to do as opposed to just trading time for money. It talks about starting your business. It even talks about ways that you can increase your profit while still serving your audience. All that's covered in there. It works really, really well with audio. So if you want to see me <laughs> gesturing with my New Jersey hands, you're more than welcome to, but it also works really well in audio. And so if you even, even want to take it in podcast form, it's nine hours of content. I've never done that much content before. I keep pushing it and sharing it with y'all because I want to make sure you take full advantage of it. So be sure and check it out. This week has been really fun as far as the things that we've done. Really unique as far as the live show. Um, my One of my favorite shows this week was all the podcast equipment you need. So if you want to start your podcast in the upcoming year or whenever you're watching this, this will give you the game where it's like, this is the equipment I need. This is the mic I need. These are the other, you know, the accoutrements, as they say. So the lighting, all that stuff. Because as I said, in the uh, episodes this week, a lot of the audio podcasts, if you're planning on going audio, a lot of them are actually recording video. So they have video podcasts, which are similar to mine, or they have an audio podcast, but they end up adding video later. So people on platforms like YouTube and TikTok get access to it. Do not miss this episode if you're starting any type of podcast in the future. Be sure and check it out. This is all the equipment that you need. All the things I list in there, they can do it for less than 500 bucks which if you think about it is a, a really good deal. So it's around $500 to go and get that set up that I'm proposing. Part two also ran this week, which was yesterday, and it's all the podcast software you need. Most of these software platforms are free or very, very low cost. I actually have links in there that give you special deals that are exclusive to me. Be sure and check it out. So you got your, <clears throat> excuse me, you have your um, equipment and then you got your software, put those together. All you need is a solo host such as myself or you need guests that come on and you're good to go. Midweek, we also had a rest marathon where I think it was five, maybe six, but I think it was five of my live episodes just about rest. We're talking about getting your mental health together. We're talking about uh, learning how to nap and how to rest even better at nighttime. 
We're talking about balancing your life. All that's covered in there. There was so much support for the, those live episodes when they first ran over the last two to three years because the show's coming on its third anniversary. So it's stuff from the past three years. All put together, it's about a three-hour program. Again, works really well with audio, but feel free to watch too. Do not miss it. I want to make sure that you guys are well rested for the upcoming year too. I'll tell you what, after doing a live every weekday, <laughs> every weekday for this month, I'm definitely going to be finding some type of rest coming into October. I'll tell you that. I'm definitely going to walk the walk on that one. And last but not least, building your subscribers from zero. I had a great conversation with James Oliver Jr. Shout out to you, who's the founder of the Parentpreneur Foundation, as well as the new app called Kabila, which connects co-founders. So if you're doing a startup and you're trying to find another co-founder, this would be the app. All those links are below in, if you click the interview, all the links are below on that. We had a great conversation about how I built up um, y'all, frankly, in this community from virtually zero subscribers to the 18,000 plus that we have as of this recording. I'm very proud of us building a community and for y'all supporting me and the work I'm doing here at, at Bring Your Worth TV. But there's also three strong tips that I'm giving James and breaking down all the inside baseball, the science. I look behind the curtain as far as how I helped build up this community and how y'all decided to be a part of it. And there were strategic decisions that were made so that we can all connect to each other and know that we had each other's back. Be sure to check it out. Again, if you're starting a podcast, audio or whatever, even if you're building communities, I know some of y'all, shout out to y'all, are actually building your own communities on your own platforms, whether it's uh, serving particular editors, people in the editorial functions, people that are working with ghostwriters, because my background is writing, so y'all are building those communities. Any communities you might be building, this will actually help you on that path. All right, I'm excited about today's show. Understanding artist contracts. If you've coached with me, um, even if you know me semi-personally, you know I love contracts. <laughs> I'm one of the few curators, I believe, that like likes law and actually likes the creating. But as, a, a, as a, a mentor told me many years ago, there's a business and then there's the business of the business. If your business of the business isn't right, then you can't do the business. If I was coming to you regularly through, say, this TV show, but then... I didn't own my intellectual property to the episodes I was making, or if I wasn't getting paid correctly for it, or if there was some type of weird stuff going on in the background where the paperwork wasn't right, then that would prohibit me in the future for, from showing up and or getting the revenue or the legacy that should come from me doing this is a 351st episode. But I own all my content with that. This is actually a conscious decision. If you don't understand the contracts that you're signing, then you could be the greatest artist in the world. In fact, some of the greatest artists in the world, and I've had episodes about this, have done amazing work, but they haven't owned any other stuff. Or they want to pivot in a different direction, and then they had all kinds of trouble. I'm thinking of Michael Jackson. I'm thinking of Prince. I'm thinking of Aretha Franklin after she passed away, rest in peace. Like all kinds of things can be in a mess. Today, we're going to talk about how to get your contracts right. Now, I am not a lawyer. Let's be clear. <laughs> There's no JD behind my, behind my name. Uh, but I've done 27 books, to, soon to be 27. 27th will be out again in a few weeks. And I've helped other people with their contracts. I've coached hundreds of people. And I've had my ups and downs. I want to share as much game as possible so that you can avoid some of those pitfalls. And if you're new to... Um, the artist community, whether you're a photographer, you're a, a writer, you're a painter, even if you're a multimedia creator like myself, then you can get those basics so that when you do sign a contract and all of us eventually sign some type of contract, then you'll know what you're getting into. So if you have any questions as far as artist contracts, be sure to drop a line below. But I have some questions that I get all the time. And we're going to jump into it. First question, which I think is great. Great, great first question is, what is intellectual property? What is IP? And more importantly, what it is not. Intellectual property, based on my definition, is the execution of an idea that was thought of, not the idea itself. You cannot copyright an idea. I can have the idea of saying, I'm going to go ahead and have something called the Bring Your Work Show, and I'm going to be connecting with people twice a week. I can't copyright 
or have intellectual property around that idea. But me executing the idea, which in a meta way I'm actually doing right now, me actually having this show, this actually being a product, a service, a thing, this is intellectual property. I own this show. This is in my family's name. That's the difference. So when people talk about IP or intellectual property, they're not talking about the idea. The idea doesn't mean anything, frankly. Respectfully, whatever big ideas you have, they're fantastic. But you can't hold ideas. You can't copyright ideas. And if eventually, over time, you can't even tell who came up with the idea first. Right now, we're celebrating hip hop's 50th anniversary. It just turned 50 uh, about two, three weeks ago in August, right? Because it started in 1973. No one can copyright hip hop because it's an idea. Now we attribute it to Cool Herc over at uh, Sedgwick Ave and all those things, if you know your hip hop history back in 73, but we attribute it to him, but we don't actually know, like it's not copywritten, but Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Fives, uh, Furious Fives, um, the message, that's intellectual property. That's putting hip hop into a context and saying, here it is on a, on a vinyl, on a record. <laughs> I'm dating myself, but that's how it came out, on a record. Here it is on a record. Here it is on a cassette tape or a track. That is actual intellectual property. And so if someone did something with Grandmaster Flashes uh, and the Furious Fives, the message, like Ice Cube or whoever sampling it later, which means they take a piece of the song and they turn it into another song, they have to pay the copyright owners, the people that own the intellectual property, a proper amount of money based on what they negotiate. That's intellectual property. Now, a key thing that, um, that uh, there's a lot of discussions about with, I do videos about intellectual property, again, at bringyourworth.tv. There's a whole playlist about intellectual property. And then there's also um, um, some things about contracts. And in fact, I have some ultimate guides about contracts. All the links are below, or you'll see them on the side in the chat. If you see some of the discussions in the comment section, there can be some argument and confusion where it's like, oh, well, as soon as we create something, then we own the intellectual property, so we should own it forever. Maybe in a universe way, <laughs> maybe in an ideal world, to be honest, but that's not how it works. When we sign a contract, when we decide to distribute something through a, say, Sony Music, if you're a musician, uh, through Penguin Random House, because I've been an author many times over, or I've done a bunch of books, books with Penguin, you see them right behind my head, with you sign a contract with Penguin Random House or whatever. Once you do that, then your intellectual property isn't based on you just creating something, it's actually based on whatever contract you sign. So that's why you see artists, again, prints. I have a, a couple videos about prints at bringingwork.tv. You can check them out right now that talk about how he had to fight to get his intellectual property back. About Michael Jackson, him trying to get the rights back and even getting the rights to some of the Beatles catalog for a long period of time until after his death. All those different things mean that we need to separate the person who's creating things and our artistic right from making something from what we decide to give away or share, what we decide to partner with to get something distributed. Now, I own my own publishing company. It's Bring Your Worth. That's why I talk about being indie. So it's a complete Bring Your Worth collection. It's under my family name. If you go to Library of Congress, you'll see it there, right? Under the brown name. So I, I'm not giving away anything. But if I want to work with, say, my last book, I worked with Union Square which is a part of um, Barnes and Noble. So it's my book, Career Remix. If you're a long viewer of the show over the last year or two, you've heard me talk about it a lot. This came out about a year and a half ago. I share the intellectual property with Barnes and Noble. That means I don't have 100% ownership of it and neither does Barnes and Noble. We share it, but that's based on the contract that was signed. So technically I wrote, not technically, I wrote every single word <laughs> in the 6,000 word book or sorry, 6,000, 60,000 word book. It's not 6,000, 60,000 word book. The point is, is though, when I decided to get it distributed, I decided to share some of those rights, share some of that intellectual property. And based on what was negotiated with myself, as well as with my agent, shout out to Marilyn, we were able to figure out a way that was equitable for everybody. But just because you create something that doesn't automatically give you intellectual property rights until it's executed. And then once it's executed, it depends on what rights you might share with the people that are helping you get it out there. 
right? So if, um, if the Rolling Stones have a deal with, say, Columbia, they can be making all this great music, which they do make great music. They're classic. They are sharing that intellectual property of creating that music with Columbia or whatever label they happen to be with. And that's based on how they negotiate. Hopefully that's clear, but I think it's really important to separate those things because sometimes we feel like it's unfair because we're artists and we want to create things and I created something, so I own it. Well, yeah, as soon as you create it, you own it technically, but if you actually want to get out into the world or if there's other um, facilities, like say if you end up working with a Sony or um, a music label and then they end up saying, okay, we'll put you in the studio, that studio time isn't free. You might be giving up part of your intellectual property to do so. Keep that in mind as you get involved with different contracts, because it's not just the nature of, again, the business, but the business of the business. And there's so many artists, including some that I've coached over the years, that have set, signing contracts and didn't realize what they were getting into. That's the difference between having an idea and then the intellectual property is actually the execution of that idea. And your rights around that idea that you execute it's based on whatever contracts you sign or don't sign. Really important distinction there. You got to keep that in mind. I'll get off my soapbox on that. <laughs> Hopefully that's clear. Such an important part of things because we, we put our blood, sweat, and tears into these things, and then we don't realize what we're giving away. And I've signed some rough contracts, so I speak from experience. A good place to start is I did a series of shorts earlier this summer understand intellectual property and 10 shorts. 10 uh, shorts, if you're not familiar, are similar to TikToks or Instagram Reels. They're 60 seconds or less, and they talk about one particular topic. I have a few hundred shorts on my channel, so feel free to check them out at bringyourworth.tv. I collected all the shorts that have to do with intellectual property, though, and put them onto one compilation. I think it's only like seven, eight minutes long. It's very brief. It goes over some of the things that will help you navigate your artist contract. We'll get into more into some other resources too, but this is a great place to start. Again, it's only a few minutes long. They're shorts. So I'm explaining um, points and percentages. I'm explaining royalties. I'm explaining advances. I believe there's a quite a few topics I'm explaining. Work for hire. So many topics that we see in a contract and we can get intimidated or confused or worst of all, just ignore it and just sign the contract. You got to know what's happening, particularly if you're going to bust your behind and, you know, and get your work going. Book I recommend, and not just because I, I made it with uh, my colleague, Jeanette Hurt, is The Passive Writer. The reason why this book is important is because we end up breaking down different ways that writers, and I'm a former journalist, still am, but it used to be my full-time job, how journalists like myself can do independent work, can write, and then still own some of that work, some of that intellectual property that we do for these major magazines, and then do more with it. My first major business book was The Bite Says Entrepreneur, the one that's featured in the complete Bring Your Worth collection that's coming out in a few weeks. So it's all, all in there. And some of, that, some of that content began with my column with Inc. Magazine which I was way more active with at that time. I've slowed down a little bit, but I still have a column with them over at inc.com slash author slash Brown Damon. My point is that depending on what contract I end up signing with Inc. Magazine, I might not have been able to, I could have done a column with Inc., had a great idea with it, and I'm like, you know what? This could work really well as a book. And then Inc. could have said, depending on the contract, they could have said, no, you can't do that because we own that because you did this, this column for our magazine. Instead, we ended up negotiating a contract so that they had ownership for a set period of time. It's called first rights. They had ownership for a set period of time. And after a period of time, I could do whatever I like with it. And there's so many other things that I've done with getting my intellectual property back. So be conscious as far as what you might be doing or might not be doing with your work. You know, Jeanette and I's book gets all into that where it's like, we sometimes sign things or we end up committing to things and we don't realize, oh, five, six, seven years later, I started my ink column in 2015. So years later, all of a sudden I have best-selling books based on some of the ideas that began while I was working with them on the column. 
But if I didn't negotiate things right, then I would have had all kinds of challenges. So be careful with that particular path. Again, I'll get off my soapbox on that, <laughs> but it's so, so important and essential to the work that we do. Again, it's Bring Your Worth TV coming to you every Wednesday and Sunday at 1 11 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, Vegas time. Today, we're talking about artist contracts. And I'm going to y'all live every weekday. You can kind of probably hear my, hear my kids in the background. So this, this is live and direct. <laughs> and we're hustling here. We're doing our thing. I'm trying to help you level up with your creative contracts going into the year 2024. To be frank, though, a lot of stuff I'm talking about here applies to any year. But we're talking 2024 now. All right. What is runway? What is runway? We talked about it very briefly in, uh, in episodes here and there, but I want to get very specific. When people talk about runway, it is the amount of money, amount of time that you can do your work based on the money that you have. So if you have $2,000 in checking and you know it costs $500 a month to run your particular business, not counting your personal stuff, but run your particular business, then it's 2000 divided by 500, which equals four. That means you have four months runway. Not a lot of time. You better get some clients, right? <laughs> That's not a lot of time. The more runway you have, the more freedom you have with your work. Now, here's the key part of it. When we sign on these particular contracts, we're often given an advance. You might have heard of that. An advance is the money that they give you when you sign the contract. Usually it'll be half the advance. Sometimes it's all the advance, but that's a little bit more rare. But it's often half the advance when you sign and then the other half when you complete the project. For instance, if you're doing a book, this is published through Bring Your Worth Publishing. Thank you very much. But <laughs> if you're with a traditional publisher and they're like, hey, Damon, hey, Jeanette, we're gonna, we want you to do the passive writer. Let's go ahead and do this book. We're like, cool. They're like, great. We're going to give you a $20,000 advance. We're going to give you 10000 now. And then the manuscript, when completed, is due about a year from now. So September, let's say, of 2024. Cool. When you guys have the complete manuscript and everything's edited and it's ready to go to the printer, then you guys will get the other half of the advance, which is $10,000. That's the advance. The advance, quite literally, in any case, whether it's uh, the music industry, it's set up a little bit differently, but it's same, the same top terminology. It's a, a music advance. It's an advance on a TV show. If you're being like a, um, a creator for a television show and, and someone wants you to, to write a script, it's, it's a very similar process. The advance literally is supposed to be the money that you live on while you create the project. And so if you end up getting a particular advance and they say, hey, here's a $5,000 advance and your project is due a year from now, they're basically saying, here's $5,000 to live on for the next year. Of course, if you do the math real quick, they're giving you the equivalent of what four hundred dollars a month, which you know I don't know where you live, but you know it doesn't work in Vegas. And so, as you talk about these creations, that's what the advance means. The advance leads directly to runway, because if the advance isn't right, you're not going to have enough runway to make it. I've been there before. I've been excited to get a book deal or whatever, whatever, and then I'm like, well, I can make that work. And then it's a month or two in and it's like, wow, I already went through that money and I still have 80% of the project to write or create. That's a tough place to be. Runway is important because that should be into negotiation of your advance. So I know folks who have gotten major book deals, let's say a book deal for six figures, which sounds like a lot. So let's say it's $100,000 for your book. Awesome. You're excited about it. Your book is due in three years. Okay. I got some time and then it's going to, and it's due. So you put in the manuscript. Cool. But then it's actually not going to get published because public, publishing industry, publishing industry is slow. It's not going to come out for another year after that because I need to schedule it. All right. So that means four years. You're not going to make any more money related to that book until you get royalties from the book being sold. And that's after those royalties make up for the money that they gave you in advance, which is why it's called the advance. So you might not get 
those first royalty opportunities until the year after it's out. So we're talking five years. So they give you $100,000, three years to work on the book, follow the math here. The book comes out a year after that. It's four years now. And then your first royalty statement, which means they figure out how many copies are sold in the first year, doesn't come until the fifth year. It's five years. So that $100,000 check they, they gave you, not counting your agent, which usually takes 15%. Shout out to agents. It's completely fair. But that's the way it is. They take 15%, not counting taxes. Taxes, depending on the amount, you're talking 20 to 30%, maybe more if you're a baller like that. Not counting any of that. You're living on $20,000 a year for the next five years. Now, you might have teaching positions. You might do a whole lot of other things. I have like five, six different businesses that I run. That's part of the reason why I have the passive income and I'm involved in so many different things. Because if you're just saying, I got a $100,000 check, I'm good. Let me go buy a house. That's not going to happen because you got to take the taxes. You got to take the agent out of it. And also it needs to last you for those five years. And that's if you're fortunate enough to sell through, which is the term, sell through those amount of books so that your royalties at that end of that first year are more than the 100000 that they gave you. That's a lot of serious math. Feel free to watch the replay and you know rewind it or what have you. But that's the basic core of how we make a living as artists, particularly if we have traditional systems, which is why being independent and having your own publishing company and other things, there's risk involved, but it can be way more advantageous because you get the money sooner. My point is that when you sign these contracts, it has to be based on whatever your runway is. That's why you have to know your budget. That's why you have to know um, what you need. And that's why you have to know, which is why I bring your worth, what your work is worth. Because then you end up signing a contract and then ends up being way below market value or what you're actually worth. You might be stuck with that particular contract for a very long time. There's certain contracts that I signed early on that I've just started to be able to negotiate, just starting to get my rights back on certain things, just starting to negotiate that. And I've been in the game for a long time. You see the gray hairs. So whatever you sign, you want to make sure that it fits what your particular runway is. So do me a favor right now, calculate what your runway is. So as you're going to look at these artist contracts and you break it down year to year, if it ends up being that long term, figure out if it actually fits the vibe and the space that you're in. If it doesn't, it might be worthwhile going forward anywhere anyway, but finding other alternative financial resources to do so. Or it might be worth negotiating harder or maybe even passing up on the deal. Be sure to throw your questions or, or uh, feedback below. But I know it's a lot of information, but it's so, so important. That's one of the reasons why I coach people so much is that so many of us artists aren't familiar with that type of thing. One of the best books that you can check out on this is by Jenny Blake. Shout out to Jenny. Hope you're doing wonderful. Fantastic book. I've recommended it a few times on here. It leans more towards the entrepreneurship world, but it also fits really well into the creativity and the work that we do. This book, out of many of the books that I've read, living in Silicon Valley a few years back, the whole thing, have my own startups. This has perhaps one of the best definitions of runway. That's why I'm bringing it up here. I think there's a whole chapter dedicated to it. It's not a chapter. It's a whole section, several pages. Check out the book. See her breakdown of runway. Because when you're starting something new, when you're um, building a business, even when you're pursuing something that's long-term artistic, like writing a book, that's like a two, three-year process for a lot of us. My first major book took me five years. That was five years of my life, and I was still pretty young. So if you're going to be taking that leap or looking into it, you need to have a longer view and understand your runway. This has, again, out of all the books I've read, one of the best definitions of runway and a best way, one of the best ways to figure out if your runway is enough based on what you have coming in and more importantly, the contract that you're potentially going to sign. All right. We're, we're talking heat today. This stuff is important. Again, it doesn't matter if you have the best work in the world, if your contract's not right then, you know, you won't necessarily have a legacy. You won't necessarily be getting the income that you want to get. And more importantly, you won't have the creative control that you think you might deserve because it really depends on the contract that you sign. 
feel free to jump in. Let me know if there's any particular questions or insights that you guys have as far as with the contracts or anything, any, uh, any, any jams you might be in and we might be able to talk it through a little bit. Be sure and check out the, um, the link, link below too, as far as with the understanding intellectual property in 10 shorts. If there's anything on this replay or in this live show that you might sound confusing, I'm, I'm happy to um, break it down in those shorts. All right. Last question. Unless you guys have more. What is ownership? It sounds silly. Like, what is ownership? What does ownership mean? It actually does mean something. It's not as simple as saying, I created it, so I own it. Ownership means who has the creative control over a particular property, idea, even service. That's what ownership means. Ownership comes down to um, uh, one of my favorite terms, and I talk about it again in the and the um, um, the guide to intellectual property in ten shorts, understanding intellectual property in ten shorts. Got the name of it suddenly. <laughs> the link is right below or in the chat. Be sure and check it out. This will probably that will probably be the most essential episode, aside from the next episode I'm going to share with you that you should watch. But if you're cramped on time, just get the definitions. One of my favorite terms is points or percentages, depending on the creative. Uh, area you're in or your medium, you'll hear either points or percentages. Even in um, if, if you dealt with mortgages, if you bought a house or if you're a mortgage broker or whatever, people will talk about points. If you're involved in um, the music business, they'll talk about points. If you're involved in the media business, as far as with books, they'll talk about percentages. These all mean essentially either royalties and or ownership. When you create something, Again, from your idea, your intellectual property, and you create it on your own, you own all the percentages. You own 100%, 100, 100 points, the whole thing. You got it. The whole thing is yours. If and when you partner with other folks, such as a distribution company that will get your stuff out there, in the music world, it might be Empire, which is something, uh, a business that just distributes music for indie artists. They take a smaller cut than a traditional music label like a Def Jam, but they still take their cut and they distribute it through their channels. They might press up some CDs for the <laughs> five of you that are still buying CDs. Shout out to y'all. But they'll do that. But then they won't actually take ownership, per se, of the work, as far as I know. They just distribute it. So the independent artist still owns 100% of the percentages or the points. They own the whole thing. You might work, again, as I mentioned, like with a Def Jam or with a, um, um, a Sony and one of their labels, let's say Polygram. You end up working with one of them. They might say, hey, we own this whole thing. Our company owns the whole thing, but you'll get a particular royalty based on this. And so based on those numbers, maybe you have 10 points or 10%. So if the CD dating myself again, CD sells for $20. Then after the wholesale price and all that stuff, the actual profit might be $10. If you have 10 percentage points or own 10% of that profit, that means you get a dollar for every CD sold. So it's $20 CD, you get 10% of that, of the, 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 um, the actual wholesale price, which is $10. So you get a dollar. The more independent you can be, the more you own and get of those points or percentages. So the work that I do, for instance, with Career Remix, the book that came out about a year and a half, two years ago, shout out to Barnes & Noble. The percentage I get whenever you guys buy a copy of this is relatively small compared to, say, you, those of y'all that have already pre-ordered this one. They have very different percentage or points, because this one is actually through a major publisher called Barnes & Noble. This one is from my own publishing company called Bring Your Worth. The ownership and the percentages owned, or the points owned or gotten, are very different between these two things. I knew that going into it, but I felt like it was a partnership that was worthwhile to work with Barnes & Noble, because I worked with them in the past. We had some bestsellers. It makes perfect sense to me. What you need to do is walk into these situations with your eyes open. 
So know that if you go independent, that that percentage that you own is, could be 100%, as is the case with my stuff. Or if you're going to go into certain partnerships or signing a certain contract, then there's only going to be so much you'll be able to own because obviously there's other people involved. And if you end up signing particularly intense contracts, you might not own anything. And that means they can kind of run with it. I remember having a conversation with someone about the music business ages ago, had to be 10, 20 years ago, long, long time ago, back when I lived in Chicago. And they were talking about um, a major rock group. I won't even mention their name because I didn't want to <laughs> spread any rumors. But however they set up the rock group, only one of the members, I think it was the lead singer, if I remember it correctly, actually owned the rights to the name and the likeness of that group. So technically, the lead singer, who was the face of the group, could fire everyone involved, and they might have fired everyone involved, which might have been why we were talking about it at this random music party. They could fire everyone involved and then replace the guitarist, the drummer, <laughs> the xylophonist, whoever was involved, the percussionist, everybody. And they still can make albums under that name, but that's because the name was owned and likeness, the intellectual property, the execution of this rock band idea was owned by the lead singer. This is that same idea, except it could apply to a major music label. It could apply to a venture capitalist firm. Shout out to my VCs out there, but this does happen. It could apply to a major publishing company. It could apply to a partner that you end up working with and you don't realize what contract you're signing and suddenly they can run with it in directions that you had no intention of, even if the idea originated with you. So be really thoughtful as far as percentages and points, because that also obviously will affect your runway and how much money you'll be getting in royalty into the future. I know there's certain contracts that I signed that I knew I was giving away my intellectual property rights. But the amount of royalties or money that I asked for, I increased it by 50 to 100 percent. And the company said, yeah. So then that ended up being a great trade off where I was like, I can make double the money. I can make more intellectual property, which obviously I did, but I, I can make more intellectual property. I'm willing to give that away. And you guys give me 200 percent return based on what you're originally saying. Fantastic. We both walked away happy. We still have a good relationship to this day. Cool. Not a problem. So know exactly what you're getting into. If and when you want to go deeper, this is the place to start. Beginner's Guide to Contracts and Partnerships. It's super short. It's about a half an hour long. And it's two or three episodes talking about red flags to contracts, um, how to build up uh, co-founderships and so forth. Uh, like when you create something together, you're essentially co-founders. Um, all those different things. A lot of these adventures that I've been on, and I'm kind of going in these adventures <laughs> over, over the many several years, it's been a roller coaster ride. I'm taking all those insights, as many as possible, and trying to share them with you so that you can learn from some of those good decisions and sometimes not good, not so good decisions in the long term that I end up making. And you're able to level up what you're doing. One last recommendation is the book Venture Deals by Brad Feld and Jason Mendelson. I do not have a physical copy, but I have a digital. I got like the first edition many years ago. Um, fantastic book. Brad Feld is a very well-known, at least within the VC communities, very well-known VC, very respected. Um, excellent column or articles he's done for Inc. Magazine, even talking about mental health and depression and all those ups and downs that come. Even if you don't have those kinds of issues, those things come with, with uh, startups and with foundership because as an entrepreneur, as you might understand, a lot of us are kind of creating our own path. And it's yet, yet to find that mental toughness. He talks about that. He's always been very vulnerable about it. I respect him and I love his work. I think this is his only book. I wish he would do more. Fantastic book, though. It's really simple. The subtitle is, I think it's how to be smarter than your, than your investor and your lawyer, which is cheeky, but he's breaking it down where it's all these complicated things, including percentages and points, including a cap tables and investment and series A and all these different things that even I sometimes struggle with those terms. He's able to break it down and be super coherent with it. They've updated the book like 20 times. I think it's like the fourth or fifth edition. Here's a hint. If a book has a fourth or fifth edition, that means that the publisher sold through 
the original edition of it and there's demand for more copies of it and or an updated version. So if he's on his fourth version, Brad and uh, his colleague Jason are killing it. So it's definitely worth checking it out. I'm sure they add a lot more. Again, I have the first edition back when I was doing Cuddler, the last startup I did, and that was seven, eight years ago. So they've updated several times. I'm sure it's way more complex in a good way and interesting than it was before. Be sure and check it out. Again, I'm a couple of degrees away from Brad. I know he's doing amazing work. His book actually reflects that. That would be my biggest book recommendation on here. One last caveat. I know you're saying, Damon, I just want to make my music. I just want to make my art. I just want to create stuff. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. There's certain do things that I've talked about on the show or haven't talked about this sh on the show that I love to do that y'all have nothing, y'all don't know about. I don't make any money from it, what have you. I think what's beautiful though is that if you decide to market or bring that stuff to the rest of the world and actually make a living from it, do a side hustle, some of those things that I specialize in, I want to make sure that you have the tools as soon as you go in and before you go in, just in case you decide to go in, that you're ready to run with it. And if you decide not to monetize some of your stuff and not to bring it into the world as a business, cool, don't even worry about it. But just in case, put this episode in your back pocket as well as the books I recommended. Again, uh, Jeanette and I's own book, particularly for you writers out there, the passive writer. We talk a little bit about intellectual property and more how to get your work out there. Recommend Jenny Blake's book. Shout out to you. This book is about 15 years old. It's still fantastic. Fantastic book. Great definition of what runway means. And finally, Venture Deals by Brad Feld and Jason Mendelson. Fantastic book just to get insight into what direction you're trying to go in. And eventually, if you want to monetize your work, I think that's everything. We'll probably have a new episode on Sunday, but I'm having some technical difficulties. So <laughs> just like last week, it's just one of those times. Be sure and keep, keep people look out. And I definitely will be live on Monday. Oh, I'm setting up a good Monday episode for y'all. I'm excited. If you don't want to miss anything, come to you every Wednesday and Sunday at 1 11 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, Vegas time. And you can subscribe, hit the notification, that's the little tiny bell icon, so you don't miss a beat. Last week of the live presentations, all through September, we're going into the last week of September as of this recording. It's the home stretch. I got some good stuff coming for y'all. I'm excited, as you can probably tell. So I can barely stay it still. <laughs> Until Monday and perhaps on Sunday, I'll see you guys soon. Remember, you can always bring your worth. You can always build from now. Take care of yourselves. And thank you for the note. Have a great week.